at the time that you're heading over to London, Jay is heavily in the drug game. And uh, well, and I, well, because from what I understand, him going over with you in London, he ended up avoiding a Fed raid that oh, was, yeah, that was yeah, happening, yeah. Uh, I guess, at one of his houses or whatever else. Well, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. It but, was, it was at, uh, you know, there were partnerships back then. So to to say his, I wouldn't say, but I would say, yeah, there were there were places. And um, yeah, he missed that. Yeah, and that yeah, it was it was pretty timely. <laughs> it was pretty timely. Okay, so you guys go over to London, you put together your first album, mm -hmm. "Word to the Jazz." It comes out uh, number eighty-seven on the R and B hip hop charts. Uh, "Hawaiian Sophie" was a single, which mm -hmm. featured Jay Z on it, and that's when I was introduced to Jazzo at that point because the the music video was on Yom TV Raps. Mm -hmm. You know, it had like the cool, like little Hawaiian kind of theme and everything. Yeah. Um, there's another song on there which ended up on the dance charts as well, right? Yeah, I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it. But that, that's, that's what was trending back yeah, then. Yeah, at the time, man. It was, yeah. it was house music and, you know, yeah. the, that type of thing. Okay. So, so the album comes out. And I mean, it doesn't do huge numbers, but I, I guess it does enough for them to invest into a second album. Yeah. Which was To Your Soul. Yeah. Which you record at D&D Studios. Yeah. The, the famous D&D uh, where, you know, Gangstar, MOP, DJ Premier eventually ended up buying it. Um, mm -hmm. Prince Paul actually did some of the production on that second album. Yeah. You know, yeah. who went on to do De La Soul, and, a ton of other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think a lot of that happened like simultaneously. Mm, okay, yeah, around yeah, it was all kind of coming time. together to hit the New York hip hop scene. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that album had the originators, which yep. I mean, even though Jay Z was technically on Hawaiian Sophie, he didn't really rap on Hawaiian Sophie, right? He just did a couple ad libs, yeah, and that's it. But the originators comes out, mm -hmm. and. Jay-Z is actually doing entire verses and going back and forth with you and everything else like that. That's when Jay-Z really got on my radar. Because I remember I bought that album at Tower Records and you know I was definitely- Man, Tower Records. Tower Records, I'm bringing it back. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that song had Jay-Z on it. And also it's that simple on that mm -hmm. album also had Jay-Z on it. Right, and that's, that's a Prince Paul production as well. Got it, got it. Um, that album comes out and you know, the originators, you know, has a video and everything, but it doesn't do huge numbers. It nope. doesn't. It doesn't go gold or, or platinum or anything else like that. So, was that essentially the end of your deal with a EMI? Mm, no. Um, let me put this shit on record uh, because I don't want people to get any indication that the quality of my music determined uh, my sale value. Um, I think it's important for me to say it rather than anybody else because I understood the mechanics that was going on at EMI. They were basically green when it came to uh, promoting and marketing hip hop music. I was the first artist ever signed, so they didn't know what to do. They were following the leads of like um, Cold Chilling, you know, and things, you know, Sleeping Bag. Tommy Boy. Right. So they were just following the lead, but they weren't getting the inside scoop. And, and the main thing they didn't understand is that the artists themselves had, um, had the know-how in, in, in which to market the music. But this was a time, again, where they didn't really respect the, the input from the artists, you know, the, the old regimes of, you know, record company, management, artists, you know, half of the time you had uh, record company meetings um, that were pertaining to the artists that the artist wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. It was the record company and the management. And then the management would convey whatever they filter out and edit for what, you know, whatever they want you to hear. And that's how it was. So, Excuse me. 
So they didn't really, and, and I'm not saying this maliciously, but they didn't really know shit about how to market the music, how to get it out there and whatnot, because um, the closest thing they had to marketing um, hip hop music was the urban music department, which was all like R&B and they were marketing people like the OJs and things of that nature. So, you know, it's not like a blame thing, but, you know, I feel like it's necessary for people to know that. Yeah, no, I mean, the quality was there. Like I said, I bought the album. Like I saw the originators music video. I loved it. I rushed over. <laughs> I bought it. I bumped it. Um, but, you know, like I said, once I was doing the research, it was like, okay, this album didn't do didn't right. really chart high, didn't do huge sales. So eventually, so after that album, were you done with EMI? Uh, no. Um, I recorded an EP mm. um, called You Don't Stop, um, which had the um, the two previous productions from Prince Paul on it, along with two productions from uh, Large Professor, mm. okay. a along with um, two productions uh, from Mark the 45 King. 